think it is. Yes, there we go. Uh, uh, some of you might remember me. I was here probably the last time, must be 18 or 19 years ago. <laughs> Most of you weren't here then. Uh, you have a nice new building, a lot of nice new faces here. Uh, but it's good to be back. I don't know what I said that last time. They waited so long to invite me back. I, uh, <laughs> I've got, I've got one more shot today, it better be good because it's going to be 18 years, might not be around then. But uh, anyway, it's good to be back with you and uh, uh, to see how the Lord has been blessing you and uh, it's, a, it's a joy to share His Word with you this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm 46, especially verse 10. Um, let me just pray before we begin. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this congregation. And I pray that you'll speak to us today, speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, and uh, let us draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but uh, when we watch the news, it makes us a little nervous and anxious. We see uh, uh, conflicts and uh, bad weather, crimes, uh, wars and possible wars and a lot of angry political uh, comments and it sort of makes, makes you uh, nervous and anxious. Uh, many of us also have our own storms in our own personal lives. And uh, this psalm, I believe, speaks to our hearts to just point us back to God and help us to uh, relax and be calm, trusting Him. Let me just read the psalm to you and let it speak to your heart as I read it. Uh, also think of phrases in this psalm that might uh, remind you of Jesus and uh, what His ministry uh, is to us. Uh, psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And this is the verse I want to especially look at today. You probably have at least the first part memorized. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Some of the phrases speak about God being with us, a present help. And uh, in the midst of us, those phrases remind me of Jesus, who is Emmanuel, uh, God with us. And that's why we can really trust God and know that he's in charge of everything uh, because of Jesus, who came to die for us on the cross and uh, is guiding uh, all of history uh, to his own glory and to fulfill his own plan. Uh, as I mentioned, when we look at news, we can get a little uh, anxious. And some people decide not to watch the news. That's one solution, just turn it off. <laughs> uh, other people maybe go to Eastern meditation and try to empty their mind of everything and just stop thinking, basically. Other people might seek help with chemical drugs, uh, alcohol, to just escape from it all and just turn your mind off that way. I think we have a better solution in our Christian uh, churches and our Christian lives, and that is to not empty our minds, but to fill our minds 
with God and his word and meditate on him and his word. We basically need to refocus on God. Be still and know that I am God. That's a phrase we probably have memorized. We know, we say it. Be still and know that I am God. When I hear the phrase, be still, it reminds me of when I was a little boy and my older brother, we would start fighting and uh, yelling and running all over the place and our parents would say, be still. That means shut up and sit down and stop hitting each other, you know. I don't think that's exactly the idea in this phrase. It's be still in the sense of be calm, relax. It reminds me of Jesus when they were on the, on the Sea of Galilee and the storm comes and he tells the storm, uh, be calm, be still. And that's what he's saying to us also, just be calm. Uh, I'm in charge, relax. And he's also speaking to the storms in our lives. Uh, I can tell your storms to just be calm, Jesus is saying. I'm the one that can do that. I can calm those storms. You know, we get tangled up in things. I get tangled up in my work. Believe it or not, I work on the computer most of the day at home, uh, developing online courses and that kind of thing. Uh, but even that can be sort of, uh, can produce tension. And I know when I get so deeply involved in something and something's not working, I just keep at it, keep at it. And then I start getting a headache. That to me is a sign God is saying, hey, just relax a little bit and go look at the, the clouds outside or something, look at the trees and just remember uh, where you are, who you are and who I am. Uh, just relax a little bit. Uh, the word for God here, know that I am God, is Elohim. That's the mighty one, the supreme one. And the next verse 11 has an interesting combination of Yahweh and uh, uh, of hosts, Lord of hosts. Yahweh is the covenant a uh, special covenant name of God for his people that he loves and takes care of in a special way. And of the hosts, that means he's, he's in charge of all the heavenly armies and all the angels. He's in charge of everything. And he can win any battle. So we have that, that wonderful combination of a God who loves us and takes care of us. And he is quite capable of taking care of us and of everything in this world as well. So what he's saying is relax, be calm, and uh, remember that I am God. We can read this two ways. Be still and know that I am God, not you, nobody else. And we can also read it, uh, be still and know that I am God. <laughs> I am God. I am in charge of everything. And uh, both of those emphases are valid here. Uh, just to give you an idea how this works, uh, I remember once when I was driving from Philadelphia to Kansas. I grew up in Dodge City, Kansas. Anybody from Kansas? Really? I don't believe it. I just asked. I didn't expect anybody to raise their hand. Where are you from? Topeka. Topeka. I'm from Dodge City. Good folks out there. But it's a long drive from Philadelphia to Dodge City. And I drove out there with uh, some friends, and I left most of them off in St. Louis and drove the rest of the way by myself. I was very tired, didn't get much sleep uh, the night before. And so about midnight, I was probably two hours away from Dodge City driving down the highway. And if you've been around Kansas, there's not a lot to look at, but uh, I'll tell you what there is to look at in just a second. And, uh, but it started cooling off. And I grabbed my jacket and tried to put my jacket on with the seat belt on. That's not a good idea. <laughs> and so here I am uh, realizing I've got my jacket all tangled up. I'm tired, I'm sleepy, I'm frustrated, and I'm bored, and I can't get my jacket untangled, and I'm getting mad trying to work this jacket off, and I finally just pulled off to the side of the road. I opened the car door, and I got untangled, and I threw my jacket down the seat, and I looked up at what? The stars. That's how I got converted, looking at the stars in Kansas. 
The heavens declare the glory of God, the Bible says. And in that moment, I looked up at those thousands of stars and I relaxed. Be still and know that I'm God. And I actually started laughing. If someone had seen me, they probably thought I was going crazy. <laughs> But it was, a, it was a laughter of relaxing and realizing God is in charge. He's up there, and I'm just a little guy down here on the earth. And just don't take these things so seriously. So that's sort of what I want to say from this verse today. God is saying to you, be still, be calm, and remember that I am God. Now, the next phrase is probably not so often memorized by us, uh, but it really fits also. I will be exalted among the nations. That's that nations, it's the Gentiles, really. It's the non-Jewish people. It's all the peoples of the earth. I will be exalted among all the peoples of the earth. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, you might be saying, uh, now he's starting to talk about something that doesn't interest me as much. He was talking about me before, be calm and remember that, that I'm God. And now he's going to talk about God being exalt, exalted in all the earth. And that's a nice phrase, but it doesn't really help me with my problems right now, but it does. And what I want to say to you is that's really our problem, isn't it? <laughs> We're saying, I want to think about me. And I want to think about my problems. And we need to do that. But we also need to take our attention off of ourselves and off of our problems and refocus on God. So that's what he's doing here. You know, be still and know that I'm God. And what that means is, look at what I'm doing in the earth. Remember what I am doing to exalt my name and establish my kingdom in all the earth. You know, we're so self-centered all we want to do is find something in this verse about me, my problems. And again, the Bible is about us and our problems, but it's more about God than it is about us. And that's how we need to refocus our thinking. You know, have you ever walked down the street uh, looking at the store windows? And uh, if you're like me, instead of looking at what's beyond the window, I start checking out how I look, you know, how's, how's my hair, how's my tie, how do I look today? Look at my own reflection instead of looking at what's on the other side of the window. And that sort of tells us a little bit about ourselves. <laughs> and so when we look at the Bible too, God is saying, don't, don't just look at your own reflection here, look at me. I want you to see me and what I'm doing on the other side of that window. And it's all right sometimes to look and see how you're doing, but you get the point. When I see movies about something like the Roman Empire, I know they did a lot of atrocious things, but what I want to say is, can you imagine how important it felt to people back then belonging to something that big? It was a big thing to belong to the Roman Empire be a Roman citizen. This is a big thing I belong to. How exciting. I want us to get excited about belonging to the kingdom of God. That's bigger and more important than any empire, than any earthly kingdom. We are part of the kingdom of God. I think we get more excited about basketball games and football games and this month soccer games, a lot of soccer fans there. It's a great month for soccer. We get excited about sports more than we do about the kingdom of God sometimes. I'm talking to myself too. But let's remember what the kingdom of God is and what he's doing. And today I want to just share a few things that I have been observing as I travel and as I talk to people and work as a missionary uh, to help refocus on God and his kingdom. First of all, God is causing the church to grow, I believe, like never before in all of history. Uh, a lot of it's been in Latin America. Uh, a lot of it's in Africa, uh, some Asian countries, and even in countries we would never expect, even in some Muslim countries. 
Uh, God is causing the church to grow all around the world uh, more than ever before. Between the years 1960 and 2000, in that 40 year span, evangelicals in the world grew three times faster than the population. See, we don't get that on the news, do we? But God is causing his church to grow. Um, if you go to Latin America, a country like Guatemala, anybody here from Guatemala? Uh, yeah, I ran out of, ran out of <laughs> countries here and places, but uh, uh, in Guatemala, uh, over half the population considers themselves evangelicals. That's in a Latin American country which was heavily influenced uh, by Catholicism, dominated by Catholicism. Um, I've been going to Cuba about once a year since the year 2000. When I first went to Cuba, uh, I asked the uh, president of the denomination that we were working with there, I said, about how many evangelicals do you think there are here in Cuba? This is a country of about 12 million people. He said probably around 200,000. Two years later, he said about 400,000. Two years later, he said about 800,000. Seemed like it was doubling every two years. And I know some of that has leveled off and some of those conversions were not real. Uh, but still, I think a lot of people would estimate there may be two million now um, uh, evangelicals in Cuba. It's hard to get the exact uh, data, but the revival has been amazing in Cuba, just as another example. I mentioned Muslim countries, and I don't have a lot of information on them, um, and I believe that's a, a, an important uh, uh, area of work right now, uh, difficult area. But just take the country of Iran. It's been in the news a lot lately. In 1972, do you know how many Christians there were in Iran? And we're talking about Christians that have come from a Muslim background, not imported people, but Christians in Iran from a Muslim background in 1972, there were 200. Not 2,000, not 200,000, not 2 million, 200. <laughs> a few years later, in the year uh, 2012, they were saying there are 370,000. Still not a big number compared to most countries in the world. However, the rate of growth from 200 to 370,000 is amazing, absolutely amazing. These are the things, again, we don't see in the news, but let's meditate on these things and think of what God is doing in the world. God is moving people around like never before. Some of that can be frightening, problematic, and diff difficult. Uh, however, let me just give you one example of where I think God is using that, and that's the country Spain. Any Spaniards here? <laughs> I better quit. <laughs> uh, Spain, interesting country, resisted the Reformation, has become very secular, humanistic, anti-church until you criticize the Catholic Church, then they'll defend it. It's their mother, bad mother, but it's their mother. But the uh, church growth of real conversions, the uh, growth of the evangelical church there has been very slow. But what is happening now? Uh, when we go to Spain now, if, if, again, I like to ask there too, how many are from Latin America? The majority will raise their hand. Latin Americans have been going to Spain. Many of them go as Christians, and they share their faith with the Spaniards. And it's hard for them to fit in, but I've got a hunch their children are going to fit in. They're going to learn to speak with a theta, and uh, uh, they're going to know the, the history of Spain. They'll know the culture of Spain. They're going to fit in a lot better. They're going to marry Spaniards, they're going to become a part of that country. They're going to share their faith with the Spaniards. Another interesting data, piece of data in Spain, 
There are two million Muslims there. That's more than the Protestants in Spain. But what is God doing? Bringing all these Latin Americans over to Spain, bringing Muslims to Spain. What do you think he's doing? Not only reaching the Spaniards, he's reaching the Muslims that have moved to Spain. We know a, a, a Peruvian lady who meets with two Muslim ladies every week to, to do a Bible study with them. There you go. That's it right there. A Peruvian lady working with two Muslim ladies. That's what God's doing. He's moving people around for his purposes. He's causing the church to grow. He's moving people around. There's more theological education. Um, when I first went to Chile in the year 1978, <laughs> uh, I went to teach in a seminary. And when I would run into a, a Pentecostal or Assembly of God or some kind of charismatic person, I'd say, uh, your pastor, where did he go to seminary? Oh, we don't have seminaries. That was what they would say. We don't have seminaries. I said, why not? They would always quote the same verse. The letter kills. The letter kills. That's why we don't have seminaries. They were misunderstanding that verse in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. The letter kills, which really means legalism, being, trying to be saved by the law and gain the favor of God just by your own, your own merits, your own works. That's what kills. The letter of the law, trusting the law kills. Not studying. <laughs> you know, all through the Bible, we're encouraged to uh, read his word and uh, meditate on his word. But that's changed. There are a lot more seminaries now. In fact, uh, we'll be going to Chile in August uh, to help an Assemblies of God church establish a new little informal seminary in their congregation. Have a conference and we'll help them get a little seminary started. Things have changed. They're hungry for God's word. And the Lord has converted many people through these charismatic Pentecostal churches and these crazy guys preaching out on the plaza and so on. The Lord is touching lives and now they're studying his word. There's a great hunger for that. As, uh, as you know, I work with Third Millennium Ministries now. We do online courses and prepare offline materials as well. They have some excellent videos with Bible teaching and theology classes uh, that you can use for free on, online. And you can get them for free online. You can study them any way you want. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But these have been uh, distributed to every country in the world. Literally millions of people uh, watch those videos. And as we design online courses for people to actually study them and take tests on them, do the homework, uh, there are more than 5,000, it's almost 6,000 now, students that are studying these courses online. They're enrolled in courses studying them. Uh, that's uh, over 2,000 in English, around 2,000 in Spanish, and about 1,000 in Chinese. And now they're being translated into Arabic and Russian. Praise the Lord. All these people studying uh, around the world. There's a real hunger for that. I want to say too that God can use all of us and any small gesture to establish his kingdom and to touch people's lives. Uh, we know a, a friend over here in uh, Old Cutler Church that uh, his name is Luis Soto. Uh, and he grew up in the Dominican Republic. He had a friend called Suhel Michelin. And he shared his faith with Suhel. Suhel became a Christian. Suhel became a pastor. Suhel studied when we were teaching with Flight here just a few miles away from here with Les Thompson and the Logoy bunch. Uh, Suhel was one of our students, excellent student. And uh, he started writing books. 
He started preaching sermons that are online to be watched and listened to. <clears throat> and everywhere I go now around Latin America, people know Suhel Michelin. I was in a conference in Chile. A lot of people had changed their doctrine, had become reformed. Uh, you know, there's a lot of prosperity gospel. There's a lot of straw and hay and superficial stuff there. But about 30 people there had become uh, reformed. And I asked them, what happened? They all mentioned Suhel Michelin. Suhel Michelin, Suhel, Suhel. Oh my gosh, I know this guy. And I know the one who brought him to Christ. And I came back and said, Luis, do you realize what the Lord is doing through Suhel? He said, yeah, I know. I know. But when he shared his faith with Suhel, I don't think he had any idea what God was going to do through him. Some of you know the book, uh, The Little Prince. <clears throat> the same author has written other things. Uh, I'll try to pronounce his name. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, something like that. Uh, French name. Um, he also wrote about a man riding on a train from France to Poland. And on this train, he walked back to one of the cars at the rear, and there are a lot of poor people sitting on the floor, families with children, and he couldn't take his eyes off of one little boy. He said, the face of this boy, he said, this boy has the face of a musician. He said, this is a little Mozart. And he began to think, are they going to take care of this boy? Is he going to be able to become a Mozart? What's going to happen with this boy? If nobody takes care of him, we've lost a Mozart. You see, when we look at those little boys, little girls, adults too, who do we see? <laughs> do we see just the way they are now or do we see the potential in people? Do we see the Mozarts? Do we see the Suhel Michelins? Do we see the Apostle Pauls and people? We don't know what God's going to do. And we may never know how we have touched someone's life. That's not up to us. It's just up to us to be faithful and trust him uh, to work his will and establish his kingdom. And the main tool he uses is the gospel. If you remember Acts 1, when the disciples, after Jesus' resurrection, in verses 6 through 8, uh, the disciples asked Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom of God to Israel at this time? And what was Jesus' answer? He said, well, don't worry about the timing here. That's not what's important. Just go and wait and the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will do what? You will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I think if I'd been one of the disciples, I would have thought Jesus misunderstood. No, no, Jesus, we're talking about the kingdom. Remember? Remember when David was king and all that wonderful stuff? Are you going to restore all that right now? And Jesus understood perfectly the question. He answered it perfectly. They just probably didn't understand the answer. Jesus is saying this is much bigger than you realize. This is much bigger than the kingdom of Israel under David. This is much bigger bigger than the Roman Empire. This is bigger than anything you know. And it's eternal. So I'm asking you to testify to me. It's the gospel that will break through an unbeliever's heart. It's the message of Jesus dying on a cross that will open his heart to receive him and become a Christian. You know, this phrase in, uh, in uh, Psalm 46.10, I will be lifted up. That's really what it means, literally. I will be, be exalted. Literally, I will be lifted up. And you see, Jesus was lifted up on the cross. And if we want God to be exalted, 
his name to be lifted up, we need to preach the message of Jesus being lifted up on the cross. That's how God is lifted up, by telling how Jesus was lifted up on the cross and died for us, and he rose again. He was lifted up from the grave, too. That's the gospel message, and it's also the message that tells us if God can turn that, the crucifixion of Jesus, the most horrible, un unfair treatment of any person in the history of the world, the one who did not deserve it, if God can turn that into our salvation, what can he not do with these events that seem to make us nervous and anxious? He's got to sleep. Has he gone on vacation? That's what a little child asked her mother once when she kept telling her, just trust God, God. And then when this mother got all upset and started crying, the little girl said, well, what happened to God? Is he, is he gone? No, God's not gone. <laughs> your, your pastor's on vacation. But that doesn't mean God is on vacation. Now, he's, he's always there. He's always working to establish his kingdom. We need to refocus on him and what he's doing. And just to finish, I would like to put a couple of pictures. If you'll put the first picture up here, I want you to look at this one first. Um, and just hold it right there a second. What do you think this man is doing? What would you say this man is doing right now? You can answer if you want. What do you think he's doing, anybody? Making what? Making a track? Okay. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing. Oh, planting a seed. Uh, could be. Good answers. It's hard to tell just by looking at this. Now let's look at the second picture. This is the aerial view. <laughs> Do you see the little cars down there and the buildings, the little trees? How, you see how far up we are now? What was that man doing? He was making an, art, an artwork. This is called land art. And this particular one is called Wish, done in Ireland by a Cuban American. That probably took a long time. And the thing is, if you look at him close up, you just see him moving a string, moving rocks around. It looks like he's planting seeds, or it's hard to tell what he's doing. But if you look from above, from God's view, you might say, you see a beautiful picture. And that's what I want to encourage you to do today. Uh, we need to look at the little rocks. We need to look at the strings sometimes. We need to watch those little things that we're doing. But let's never lose a bigger perspective. And let's take our eyes off of these problems and the things that sort of make us anxious. And let's get up and see the aerial view from God's point of view and see what he's doing. He's building his, his kingdom and he's going to do it. The victory is ours. We don't understand so many things. We don't have to understand them. We just need to trust God. Be still and know that God is God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us in your word that